coming and being a part of our active shooter training. I was just telling Anthony, who's going to be leading us in our prayer in just a moment, I never thought we as a church would get to this point. Uh, but this is our reality now, and we're going to have to prepare ourselves. And so we've invited uh, Al Logan, a deacon from the uh, Crenshaw Church of Christ, as well as a retired sheriff. I have more to say about him in just a few moments, but right now we're going to invite Anthony up. <clears throat> I do want to give you just a few, uh, I guess, housekeeping things. The ladies' restroom is downstairs to the right, men's downstairs to the left. These are exit doors over here, exit doors over here, exit doors in the back. If we have an emergency, uh, you will be directed to, to go out either one of those doors. Uh, Masks and social distancing are not required, but are strongly recommended. And so we decided to have it in here so that you could uh, have some space. We have water in the back and mints, uh, and we're just gonna have a great session this morning. And of course, at the end, I'm quite sure there'll be Q and A, we've got mics and we'll be able to facilitate that. Anthony, will you come? By the way, this young fella, we go way back, he's the minister over at the Compton Avenue Church of Christ. If I'm correct, it is older than Jerusalem. I mean, the same word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pray with me, please. Dear God in heaven, we thank you so much for this day and for your blessings. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have, Father, to come together just to make ourselves aware of, as Vince says, what is really our reality right now. Father, I'm thankful to this congregation and its leadership for their uh, insight, Father, and in realizing that this is something that though we, we might try to ignore is something that we really need to consider and be prepared for just in case of course we we know that you are god and you'll be there for us but we do recognize that satan is still present and as a result father things can happen so we just ask it now father that you just be with us uh, uh be with uh the deacon who will come forth father to share with us his knowledge and i hope and pray father that we might be blessed by it be with us continue to keep us in your care this prayer we do ask in your son's name Amen. Just a few more things about uh, Deacon Al uh, Logan. I met him <coughs> pre-pandemic. They had a workshop over at Crenshaw and several of us from the Figueroa Church went over and we were a part of that and we were impressed by it. And we had planned to have them right before the pandemic. Pandemic hit and so everything was shut down and so we decided that uh, we would have him come now uh, again at his wife and daughter. He has three daughters. Yes. But uh, there is one. Raise your hand. Come on, raise. And that's his wife as well. Raise your hand. All right. Good to have them with us. Uh, he's a retired sergeant after 20 years. Correct. All right. Recruiter. Uh, and some of his assignments are patrol, mobile command post, recruitment, staff writer, trainer. May they protest downtown LA property and evidence. So he is still busy as a V, uh, but he <laughs> serves on the AV team uh, at Crenshaw as a deacon with some other responsibilities. And we're just happy to have you with us. Man, God bless you. And the floor is yours. Now give him a round of applause to say good morning, Al. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Brother Hawkins. Um, I will say this, you all are moving forward as a church because a lot of churches, because of this type of topic, they don't want to fully address it. We addressed it at Crenshaw. We had several meetings with our deacons and elders and then the congregation. And we started talking about this like a couple of years before the pandemic because active shooters are real. Um, as we'll go through the presentation, you'll see that it it does happen at churches and places of worship. So um, kudos to your leadership and Brother Hawkins for bringing me here. The class today is going to be 
we're going to talk about active shooters, what to look for and things like that. I do show a video with actors, but it's a graphic video. So there's blood and things like that, simulated blood, but it's not an actual active shooter. Um, other than that, I'd also talk a little bit in detail about shootings and what to expect during shootings. So if the video may be a little too graphic for you, please feel free to step out during the video. I, I've emailed Brother Hawkins a transcript from the video because I really want you to receive the information from the video and not be so shocked by the video that everything that's said is or is lost. So that, excuse me. So that also will happen in the class. There won't be any surprises. They won't, there won't be any um, simulated kidnappings or active shooters or anything like that. What I want you to all to do is learn from this training. This training also applies to other places. It's not only applicable to your church, but wherever you are, because active, shooter, active shootings happen in all kinds of settings, at schools, at malls, at your work, at places of worship, government buildings. So that's why this information, I don't want you to come in and think this is only appropriate or will work here for your church, but everywhere you may be. And the last thing I wanna let you know ahead of time is there's no one person or one training that can possibly cover every scenario that may happen because the active shooters have been so different in what's happened and how things happen. You had the one in Colorado where the guy walked in, he threw a flashbang and smoke grenades. And as the people jumped up to start running, he started shooting people. The Virginia Tech shooter, he went to building whatever and chained all the doors locked so he could then go in. So active shooter scenarios are different. What you have to do is take the information that comes today and apply it to whatever situation you may be handed. Okay, so the other thing I don't want you to do, and this is typically what happens when I teach this class, is you start to what ifs. And you could what if this and any other situation and scenario to death. So don't start with the what ifs, just take this information and use it and apply it to whatever situation you may be, you may end up in or be handed. I am currently the uh, security manager for a large LA County department. And I also am a construction project manager. Go figure how those two came together. <laughs> All right. So also, please, 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 if you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to ask them. Um, there are a few questions that I ask of you all. I need you all to help and participate. If not, then all the questions will go to my lovely wife and my lovely daughter. So you all help them out by answering the questions. There we go. So training objectives today. Today, I want to teach you all the definition of what an active shooter is. So when you leave today, you're going to know what an active shooter is and what they are looking for in targets. That's going to help you know how you need to respond, not react, but how you need to respond and knowing what to do and how to respond in an active shooter. That is critical. That is critical. And know what to expect when law enforcement arrives. I added this uh, topic because a lot of what people think they should be doing is based on what's seen on TV and nothing can be further from the truth. So that's why I added that. 
and know what to expect during an active shooting. Once the bullets are flying, know what to expect. And then there will be a test at the end on the objectives. <laughs> so what is an active shooter? Someone want to either take a guess or does someone know what an active shooter is? There you go. Someone who comes in with a weapon shooting with an intent to kill someone. Anybody else? All right, get ready, Kayla. <laughs> this is the official definition of what an active shooter is, and I don't have this memorized, so I'm going to read it. An active shooter is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined or populated area. In most cases, active shooters use firearms and there is no pattern or method to their selection of victims. That's the official definition of what an active shooter is. Pretty much just like you said, it's someone that's trying to kill a lot of people in a short amount of time. Usually there is no, um, there's no pattern or victim intended. They wanna kill as many people as possible. There are a few cases where active shooters happen in the workplace. And a lot of times those people go in with specific people in mind to kill. Just like the shooting at the Irwindale factory, the Irwindale Edison factory where the guy went in and he said, hey, do you know where Jim is? Hey, where's Jim? And when he found Jim, he's killed Jim and several other coworkers. Those are targeted. Usually the workplace violence wounds are targeted, but oftentimes there's not a target. Their sole purpose is to kill as many people as possible in that short amount of time, because they know it's only a short amount of time. Go ahead. Uh huh. The, the shooter there, and specifically because that's where his ex in law is a wife, you know, attend the church. Right. And he went in initially with them targeted, but he also had planned on taking as many of the other worshippers with him. With right. You know, so, you know, it's. It, it can be a, a mixture of both these scenarios where you either have someone come in and sporadically looking for, you know, uh, any target whatsoever, or they come in with a specific target and then, you know, decide to do as much damage, you know, collaterally as they can while they're there. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it is usually a mixture, but primarily it's, it's the non-targeted it's the random because when you look at um uvalde you look at the um las vegas shooting the one in woodland hills the bar shooting though primarily they just want to kill as many people as possible but you do have the targeted ones where they're specifically looking for individuals but your response in what you do is going to be the same for all of them. Active shooter situations evolve really quickly, very quickly. They're unpredictable and very quickly. This means that you have to be ready and have to think about them because once those bullets start flying, that's not the time to try to come up with your plan. It's almost too late then. That's why once again, I commend Brother Hawkins and your church leadership for bringing me here so we can talk about this prior to something happening. God forbid that anything happens, but once it starts, that's not the time to try to figure out what you want to do. And they happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. 
typically law enforcement response is required to stop the shooter and an immediate response for them is required to stop the shooter. There are in some cases where they go in and they shoot and kill the people that are targeted, like you said, and then oftentimes they commit suicide. But typically a law enforcement is respo law enforcement response is required to stop the shooter and lessen harm and damage and the killing. Typically, these are active shooters are over in 10 to 15 minutes. So that's why it requires a quick law enforcement response. Um, prior to the Columbine shooting, and it seems that you know, prior to the Columbine shooting, what law enforcement would do was show up, the line officers and everybody would show up and they would contain the scene and wait on a SWAT team or an engagement team to go in and stop the shooter. But they found in Columbine that people were being killed. The students were being killed while law enforcement was on the outside. And I know some of you are thinking, well, that's what happened in Uvalde. That's what happened in Uvalde, but this, the incident commander had one thing in mind and it was something else. The incident commander thought he had a barricaded suspect, which is different from an active shooter. But now law enforcement teams go in and I was trained and I was taught, if you are that first person on scene and this is what's happening, you go in and try to stop the shooter. You go in and try to stop the shooter because they know time is of the essence and the killing will continue until law enforcement stops them. So 10 to 15 minutes, these situations are usually over. Sometimes they do go longer, like the Pulse nightclub shooting where it went from an active shooter to a barricaded and hostage situation. And that could go on for hours. The reason I'm telling you this is you have to mentally be prepared to either that all I have to do is get through the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll be okay. But just in case it turns into a hostage or a barricade situation, you may, be have, you may have to deal with it for hours. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm preparing you to think about that so that you don't lose it, so that you keep your composure, so that you're constantly thinking as this thing is going on, because it may not end in the 10 or 15 minutes. Most often it does. Okay. Here's a few statistics. So in 2020, there were 40 active shooter incidents and 2021, there were 61. And then there are other stats that go on with the number of killed compared 20 to 21. Are active shooter situations on the rise? Yes and no. It, it goes up and down over the years. We are definitely more aware of them because of Columbine and because they're in the news more often. We are also having, seeing a lot of mass shootings where two to three or more people are killed in the same incident. So those are also on the rise. And by the way, this PowerPoint presentation, Brother Hawkins has a copy of it and he'll be happy to make sure you get a copy of it if you need it or if you would like it. So when I did this presentation last, this was 2021. This was an incident that happened at a house of worship. And in 2021, they only had one incident in a house of worship. But the prior year, they had a couple, including the one you were referencing. So they are on the rise here. And this one happened Scott County, Mississippi. And this is real for us as church members, where somebody comes in with a gun 
and their intent is to do harm. Their intent can be to go after a ex or somebody seeking shelter from an ex or something like that. It can also be an internal church dispute. Don't think for one minute that this is going to always be an outside attack because it can be a member inside. When I teach this class at work, I let everyone know, don't you think for one minute that the attack is going to always come from the outside? It may be your coworker. And Joe may have just been fired yesterday and this is what he's going to do, or Joe may know he's going to be fired. So don't get in the mindset of you can see and think and know who it is because you don't. There are pre-indicators that active shoot, most active shooters have exhibited, but oftentimes I don't want you to think you can figure out who it is. Some of those pre-indicators are an, an increased use in alcohol and drugs, trauma, you can mental health issues, loss of a job, divorce, someone that's constantly on the edge, someone that has explosive responses to things that don't warrant it. All of these things is what I teach in, in my trainings at work. So when, when the supervisors see these things, they can act on them. Who's here, who's, who in here is from church leadership? Guess what? Everybody's looking to you all for protection, guidance, and leadership. So you all have to be have your hands on the pulse of the congregation so you can see these things. So you can see that person, hey, Joe has been, you know, Joe and Jane just divorced. And I've talked to Joe and he's, he's starting to talk about firearms a lot. I was talking to Joe and he keeps referencing Columbine. As leadership, you all have to have your, your hand on the pulse of the congregation. So you can see those things. And my members, when you all see and notice these things, let leadership know. This is exactly what I teach, teach the people at work. Let them know, let supervisors and managers know. So here are more statistics. 2017, that spike was caused by the Las Vegas shooting. So that's why you have a high number of deaths and a high number of injured, but you can see it dropped way down. But from 18, 19, 20, and 21, it stays relatively, um, it stays relatively flat. So in the past 20 years, these are places that, this is, that, that have had active shooters. Businesses open to the public. Businesses closed to the publics. Oh goodness, I can't read that. <laughs> Institutions of learning, churches, all these things, it happens everywhere, people. It happens everywhere. So once again, don't just think today's class, is going to be, a, I can only use that at church. You use it at the mall, the post office, whenever these things occur. Prevention. That's one of the number one things I also want to convey to you and your leadership prevention. According to the FBI, more than half of mass shooters will share their ideas with others in comments that we sometimes go, ha, 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 Jack, that's crazy. And instead of reporting it to leadership and law enforcement, it just goes unreported. The whole see something, hear something, say something. The Virginia Tech shooter that he made several references to killing people. 
But even more starking than that, the Columbine shooters went through Columbine High School the day before the shooting with a video camera pretending to shoot students. Pretending to shoot students. And you know what? When the teachers saw it, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're just working on a project. That should have been a red flag. You know what else? Students were participating by pretending to die and pretending to be shot. This was at Columbine the day before the shooting. So don't overlook these things, report it. I always, in, when I teach this class at work, I tell them, if everyone thinks about their work career, there's always a person that if someone said Jack went through and did an active shooter and killed people, there are a lot of people that say, well, I'm not surprised. If anybody would do it, it would be Jack. Because there are signs that are there that we see and are exhibited, but it goes unnoticed or it goes unreported. So report these things. Report any concerning post. There are a lot of things we see on Facebook and social media. If it's involving guns and threats and things like that, and you see it, report it to your church leadership. Let them know. You should report these things to your church leadership if anyone expresses a desire for violence, extreme anger, or if they're paranoid, thinking everybody is against them, suicidal, any of these things, an obsession with guns, if they're telling you, did you know an AR-15 can fire 30 rounds a second? That should be a red flag for you. And an obsession with previous mass shootings. Those are all red flags that you all should be reporting. And my leadership, my church leadership here, if you all are aware of these things, you should be taking some sort of action. Once again, in more than half of the cases studied by the FBI, there was a noticeable change in the person's behavior prior to the shooting. So just keep that in mind. Now, not all mass shootings can be detected or can be prevented or things like that prior to. We still want you to focus on that, but not all of them can be prevented. So when they can't, Know what to do. Know what, a, what the shooters are looking for in victims. They're looking for easy targets. Remember what I told you, what they want to do? They want to kill as many people as possible in a short amount of time. So that means easy targets. They're looking for easy targets. Someone they can easily see and hit. A victim that is not moving, the deer in the headlights. So when the bullets start flying, the deer in the headlights. And that's a possibility that will happen to you if you don't think about this. Once again, that's why it's so important what Brother Hawkins and your leadership has done, because I want you to think about these things. I'm not trying to make you paranoid where you don't want to leave the house. But I do want you to think when you're at your favorite restaurant, like Denny's, my favorite, when me and my wife sit down, we're both going, no, I, I want to face the door. Or no, I don't, I don't want to sit there. Or my back is against the wall. That's what I want you to do. I want you to take a look, which is what I did when I walked in this church and said, okay. If something happens, I see a lot of exit signs. I love it. Because I want to know how to get out of here. 
This is my first time here. So if something happens, I wanna know how to get out of here. Take those few seconds to do those things. So if something happens, I know I have an exit back there. If something happens and there's no lights or power or smoke everywhere, I know where the exits are. That's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to think about wherever you are, whether you're at this church or at Church of Compton, Church of Christ, wherever you are at your work. If your work is not teaching you this, you can take this to your work and say, if anything happens, I know I have to run 50 feet and make two rights and a left and be out the door. That's what I want you to do. And believe it or not, if you think about these things prior, when something happens, you're going to act based on your thoughts. It's called training. Because as a police officer, you, there's no way I can think about every incident that may happen. They can't teach me that in the academy. There's no way I can ever prepare for everything that's going to happen. But I take that basics and I train and I run through my head. So no matter what's thrown at me, I'm not trying to react and shuffling backwards, but I'm acting, not reacting, okay? So easy targets, someone they can easily see and hit, and a victim that is not mo moving, someone frozen. Because remember, kill as many people as possible in a short amount of time. The harder you are to see, and hit the safer you are. Remember that the harder you are to see and hit, the safer you are. What do you need to do? Quickly determine the best possible course of action for your safety. Think about that quickly once the bullets start flying. And my church leadership, people are going to look to you for what to do. Church members, children, family members, um, parents, grandparents, the kids, the children are going to be looking to you for what to do. And if you freeze and become that deer in the headlights, you're going to cause everyone following you to freeze. So have something in mind. Church leaders, aunts, uncles, mothers, managers, supervisors, during an active shooter situation, the focus is on you. So I commend everyone that's here in this class that's taking this training so you will know what to do. So we're gonna play a video now. And this video, once again, it's a little graphic, but this video is pay attention and listen to what they're saying. Go ahead, you can hit play. Thank you. A morning that began like any other turned tragic today when an employee opened fire on his supervisor and fellow coworkers. Students, parents, teachers are asking why today after a bloody rampage plunged this campus into tragedy. Details are just coming in, but we're being told that a heavily armed gunman opened fire this evening at the mall food court behind me. There's no official word on any casualties yet, but one eyewitness reported seeing at least six people shot. Active shooter, a gunman or gunmen killing or attempting to kill people in a confined, populated area. You gotta get some sleep. You're looking like a vampire. You sleep. You ain't got no babies at home keeping you up. What the hell? Them again. We've tried. I'm sorry. We're going to have to let you go. Active shooter killings are a tragic, unpredictable reality and one that's becoming more common. Since 2006, the U.S. has averaged an active shooter event with four or more deaths every 2.9 months. 
Even though the number of active shooter events has been increasing, your odds of being involved in one are still very slim. But just like fire drills and earthquake preparedness, making a plan in advance can make all the difference. Yeah, the lizard's in the tanks. I mean, it's probably fine. If you do find yourself in the middle of a senseless attack, the why doesn't matter. Hey. Hey, buddy. Hang on, something's happening. What matters is surviving. On average, 20 mass shootings take place in the U.S. every year. Killers usually choose their victims at random. They look for easy targets. So the harder you are to see or to hit, the safer you are. When an attack starts, if you can find a way out of the location, do so. Get out. If you stay calm and think clearly, even in the middle of a life and death event, you improve your chances of making it out. Visualize your movements in advance. What are we gonna do? Look at me, look at me. I can get us out. Stay behind me. Stay now. Use cover, something that will stop a bullet, and concealment, something that at least keeps you out of sight. Attention, South LA units, code three response needed regarding a 245 DSV 417. So we have the town center shopping mall, suspects wearing a face mask, possible body armor. Use any available means to get out, including emergency exits or windows. Most restaurants and retail locations will also have exits in the back through kitchens or stock rooms. Even in the best cases, police are minutes, not seconds away. You must take action to protect yourself. Okay, everybody stay calm. It's probably just a drill. If you can help others without putting yourself in unnecessary danger, okay. do so. Are okay? what, what's your name? Uh, uh, Lori. Lori? Okay. It's gonna be okay. If you can't move safely to an exit, get to a room or a confined area you can lock down. Then secure the location. Secure your location. Oh my God. There's somebody shooting. Everybody stay calm. Remember how we train. Everybody get in this corner, away from the windows. Get the emergency bag from my desk. Help her. Drywall won't stop a bullet, but there are steps to take to stay safe. Lock or barricade the doors. Turn off the lights move away from any windows, and silence your cell phone. The other door doesn't lock, move desks, or anything, just block it. A modern emergency bag can include a first aid kit, gloves, emergency plans for the building, and casualty cards to alert first responders to any wounded victims. Most active shooter situations are over in 10 to 15 minutes. Attention, Lake Wheel Units, Code 3 is needed. We're at 245 GSV 417. It's going to be at Alexandria College. Multiple victims down. Law enforcement's first responsibility when entering an active shooter situation is to stop the suspect, not to render aid to the victims. Medical teams will enter the scene as soon as the suspect is no longer a threat or is confirmed in another location. Silence any cell phones and remain quiet. Do not alert the shooter to your presence.
Sheriff's Department, is there anyone inside? Red card. Just hang tight. We'll be back to get you. Defend yourself. If you cannot escape the location and you can't shelter in place, you may have to defend yourself as a last resort. Almost anything can be turned into an improvised weapon. Look for something that can disrupt the shooter's ability to see, breathe, or control their weapon. When law enforcement arrives, they are going to be in a heightened state of readiness and awareness, looking for any aggressive movements. So keep your hands visible hey, and follow any commands you are given. A shooter! I just saw one shooter. Especially in developing situations, engaging law enforcement, running toward them, reaching for them, even to thank them, could put people at risk. <laughs> Surviving an active shooter. For more information. Thank you. Seriously. Visit activeshooter.lasd.org. What do y'all think about the video? Some comments. So real. Someone else? Thank you. It puts things in perspective. It can happen anywhere at any given time. Person who normal routine is, and all of a sudden they're faced with the realization that they've got somebody shooting them. Correct. Workers that are moving boxes, people that are in studies, teaching class, you know, they're, they're not focused on life threatening situation presenting itself in two seconds. That's right. And yet, their routine day has just been interrupted by someone who is a tall man right. on taking the life of anyone or everyone that crosses the path. That's so right. The, the thing is that the, the deer in the headlights scenario is something that we can, by training and by awareness, help prevent by the fact that it's already in our minds that I could be doing, I could be serving the community. That's right. All of a sudden, somebody in the back of the room stands up with a gun and starts shooting. What do I do? That's right. Do I stand there with a meeting plate in my hand and, and you know, worry about, well, do I really want to drop the crew the way? Or, you know, or is my next action potentially going to save someone's life. So, you know, uh, a couple ounces of grape juice, you know, in the carpet is not a bad thing to trade for someone's life. And I'm going to talk about exactly that. 
Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, yeah. So I tell you know they they say well, all right, Dad, where are you going to sit? Because they kind of like play with me a little bit, but I always tell them I have to be looking toward that door. Who's coming in? You know, and I and they don't know, but I always keep aware of like where my my outlets are, my exits and stuff. So I always have to be facing the door. I'm just they didn't get to see the part of the video because they were so I was explaining to them. I go, see you guys. You guys are like always saying like, you know, all right, dad, we're going to sit like playing around, but I'm not playing around. Like I have to look at that, at that door and see what's coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody in the back? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I just it's a little, it was a little frightening for me um, only because my mother isn't mobile. Um, she's able to walk, but she uses a walker. And if we're here at church, I know it said to save yourself first. I cannot see leaving my mother here trying to get out. So in that situation, what would, would I do? We're going to talk about okay. that also. I also teach this class at hospitals. And it really is tough because nurses think their mindset is, I'm not going to leave this patient, but we're going to talk about what to do because sometimes you can't. So what we're going to go over is run, hide, fight. Those are the three things. If you don't remember anything else from this, remember those three things, run, hide, fight, run, hide, fight. They may be on the test run, hide, fight. Also, just to go back to the video, everyone, just Google Los Angeles Sheriff's Department active shooter video, and it's there for everyone to see. You can download it, you can show it, you can watch it. Um, I just showed it to my family again recently, to my three daughters. Hey, sit down, let's talk about this. So um, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, um, active shooter video, and that one will come up. So run, hide, fight, run, get out of there if you can. If you cannot get out because of the situation, then you hide. If you can't run and you can't hide, and as a last resort, you fight. Run, hide, fight, run. When the bullets start flying, when the attack starts, you run, you get out of there, you escape. That's why it's so important to know where the exits are. Run, get out of there. Um, find a way out of the location. That's why pre-planning is so important. So you can do this because I guarantee you, once the bullets start flying, it's going to be a little harder to find those exit signs when you're trying to duck. And if you work in an office with cubicles, it's going to be even harder. So know that pre-plan, evacuate, regardless of whether others agree to follow you. So if I say, come on, Brother Hawkins, let's go, they're shooting, come on. And Brother Hawkins, no, no. You have to, and not that he will. <laughs> <laughs> right no but you have to in your mind be willing to leave those that don't want to evacuate the proverbial people that with deer in the headlights so you run evacuate have a pre-plan in mind this is so critical it will make things easier have an escape route in mind. Um, if you leadership, review these plans with, with, almost with staff, with church members. Hey, everyone, exit, 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 exit. If you're up there, look for those exits. Talk about it, think about it. Leave your belongings behind. Leave your belongings behind. 
Now, I'm going to tell you all a story that happened with me and my wife. If you see her, don't tell her I told this story. <laughs> don't tell her. So we were at Kaiser at Baldwin Park with Kayla. She was probably three years old. We had finished everything. We were in two cars and we were leaving. So we go, we're on Baldwin Park Boulevard, talking on the phone to Kayla. We're going, it has a roundabout to get on the 10 to go west. And on that roundabout, I was, I was driving the lead car and they were following and I'm talking to Kayla. Come around the roundabout, look back, see a tractor trailer coming. Oh, I'm good, I got time, so I go. And as I'm talking, I hear this loud scream. Kayla just starts screaming and screaming and screaming. And I'm, Kayla, Kayla, what's going on? What's wrong? So originally thought, I thought mom had taken the phone from her. And then I hear, ding, 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 this is on Star. We have you in an accident. You're on the 10 freeway at Baldwin Park. We're your airbags have deployed. We're notifying a rescue ambulance. Oh, shoot. They've been in an accident. Now, my, if anybody knows that area, excuse me if I choke up on this, if anybody knows that area, you have to drive all the way into El Monte, get off to come back. So I'm coming back, get up on the 10, and I'm coming back on the on-ramp, and I see fire trucks and ambulance. And I'm thinking, oh, God. So I pull up, jump out, and I run up to the car, and fire department's there. They're talking to Shani, and they have, they're, they're getting Kayla out of the car. And I look, and I see her car chair, uh, my wife's car seat shaking. And so I look in, fire department, they hand me Kayla, she's okay. And I'm looking in and they're working on my wife. And she looks back and says, honey, I said, yeah, babe, make sure you get my purse. <laughs> I got you, I got you, I'm gonna get that purse. They take her out on a stretcher they're putting her in we're on the freeway everything stopped this is seven in the evening make sure you get my purse one more time make sure you get my purse what had happened is when i came around i saw the tractor trailer with she came around there and she saw the tractor trailer she didn't have enough time so she slowed to let the tractor trailer come Seven in the evening, a drunk driver came around that curb at 50 miles per hour, slammed into the back of them, knocked their car along the K rail 30 feet and onto the freeway. There were bags and things in the back that were thrown, thrown out in the freeway and the four bolts that bolt the seats to the cars were broken. That's how strong the impact was. So you're wondering, why is he telling this story? Because in an emergency, when bullets are flying, when the adrenaline is going, if you don't have in your mind to leave those, important, those belongings behind, what's important to you and under the stress and under the action will become even more important to you because it's your safety blanket. You think, I can't move without this. So if you don't tell yourself, leave that stuff behind, you will lose your life if you're right next to the exit and think, shoot, I got to go back to my desk and get my cell phone, purse. As a cop, I've evacuated numerous buildings for bomb threats. And you know what I have people coming up to me? Hey, but my lunch is right there. Can I just run in and get my lunch? You know what? Yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Because people, that's how they respond to stress and triggers that safety net, that whatever is important to them becomes even more important. That's why I tell this story. So when this happens, you don't think, I got to get my keys. How am I going to get home? When the bullets are flying, Airplane came in too low at San Francisco airport. 
hits, bottoms out at a seawall, breaks in half, slides around. Two parts, front, back. When it came time to evacuate in the cabin and everything filling up with smoke, you know what people did? They're trying to get that overhead stuff. That, she said, we have a connecting flight. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I tell you this, because if you don't, if you don't put in your mind, leave that stuff, it's going to be more important to you. House fires and everything, I teach our kids or we teach our kids, you get out of the house. Don't try to get this or try to get that. Go ahead, you want Exactly. Right. Because by by performing a drill, they develop a muscle memory that you're going to rely on in an emergency in that flight or fight, you know, reaction. Right. To remember that you need to get yourself safe rather than worry about that bag of evidence in your purse. Right. Okay. Uh, the thing is that, you know, if you have a pre plan, how can leaders do, especially if you have a pre plan and you don't practice it, you have essentially created half of your failure. Yep. Because if the people, let me let me change that. If the sheeple that you know we deal with on a daily basis do not at least have something that they have walked through in the past, mm -hmm. all you're going to have is confusion and chaos. Uh, case in point, if I may. No, go ahead, Jutta. I worked for the census for two years. Mm -hmm. And I was basically second in command of a area office. And we had the emergency plan. The office had been in location for like two years, and no one had ever had an emergency plan. Yeah, we had the maps up on the walls. We, you know, the people were always told, okay, in case of fire, you know, here are the exits, here are the fire station. But no one had actually performed a fire drill where they had to exit the building, find their rally point, and then get with their coordinator to make sure that they were safe to the building. And I put a stop to it. It was kind of like right in the middle of the day. You know, I, I found an emergency klaxon, set up, you know, great on my phone mm -hmm. when we did a fire drill. Right. You know, and for like 30 minutes, people were stumbling around their desk. And it's like, no, leave the stuff out. Leave the stuff out. Leave right. the stuff out. You know, but we were starting to establish that muscle memory. And right. the same thing here in church. At the building, we have built in obstacles that yep. will help an active shooter. Yep. All right. Sidestepping, you know, down the pews. You know, you make it's, yourself kind it's of like a target fire. practice, yeah. So the thing is that you know what's the easiest thing to do? Roll over and get down on the floor, get out of sight. Yep. You know, but if you don't practice your plan, nobody knows what to do. And that's critical. We you wanna know what happened at our church? I'm in the media room, it's about fifteen minutes before service, so it's quite a few people and a fire alarm goes off. Lady cleaning, she sets off the fire alarm. And you know what everybody did? Sat there. Oh. So the at the end of that service, I told everyone, came up, said, hey, when a fire alarm goes off in here, you all need to act as if it's real. Don't take it for granted. So 
the pre-planning, the evacuations, the drills, they all work together. The training is the first step because we have to tell people what to do. The second step is are the drills and the practice. Go ahead, man. Okay. Now this year is not about active shooting, but um, I worked at the post office mm -hmm. and we had big, uh, somebody left big bags out in the front and it's a, it was a, supposed to be an active bombing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you treat bombing the same way as shooting. And so me, um, they told everybody to get out, but I want to go back and get my purse and stuff. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, keys, phone, medical, credit cards, time to get out, the purse can stay. You got and I'm out with you. Because I had that incident where they wanted everybody out and I wanted to get my stuff. Right. And, and it I, was a bomb. It was a bomb. And I teach this class. And I have people saying, but how am I going to get home if I leave my kid? Yeah. We are the county of Los Angeles. We will get you home. Somebody will get you home. <laughs> well, how am I going to call my, if I leave my phone? Don't worry about it. We will make all those things happen. Your church leadership and your church membership will make everything you need to have happen, happen. If you leave your keys in here, if you leave your phone, if you leave your homework. So get out, people. Put that in your mind. Leave those belongings behind. Try to prevent individuals from entering in the area where the shooter is, just like in the video where the young lady said, no, no, no. You can only try, but if someone insists on going, nothing you can do but try. Call 911 when you are safe. I don't want you doing this, trying to get 911 when the bullets are flying. When the bullets are flying, what do you need to do? Run, not call 911. You call 911 when it's safe when you're hidden, when you're barricaded, when you're off and down the street, when you can safely do so, that is when you call 911. Not when the gunman is there and you're in the hallway. So call 911 when you are safe. Use any means possible to exit. Emergency exits, the ones with the alarm, windows, the reason I put that, because there are some people in here that would think, well, I don't want to break that window to get out of here. You break and you use whatever window you can to get out of here. So if I, that's one of the things that I noticed, those nice, beautiful stained glass. But you can best believe if there's an active shooter, one of those chairs from back there are going through that window. You need to get out. And the reason I'm telling you this is, as a boy, you know, breaking a window is like a cardinal sin coming up. So get that out of your mind, especially when it has the Bible on it. <laughs> That's a cardinal sin. Get that out of your mind. Break those windows at work. I tell people all the time, break those windows at work. Exits at the rear of buildings, restaurants, stores, shoe stores, all those places, they also have an exit in the back. Don't hesitate to run through that kitchen to get out of there. If your exit is blo blocked, most of them also have exits in stock rooms. So don't think only one exit. Also, once again, like in the airplane, they tell you, look around. Because the exit you think is the closest to you may not be. So look around when you go into an unfamiliar area. Stay calm and think clearly. That's going to be very hard to do. And I don't, trust me, I don't take that, sorry, I don't take that for granted being thrown into situations where bullets are flying and I've had to think calm and clearly. 
But you have to. You have to think calm and clearly. So you can remember my exit is that way to the left and out. So you can remember I need to go up two hallways to the left and down the stairs and I'm out the door. So think calmly. Try your best to stay calm. And visualize your movements in advance. It goes back to the pre-planning and to thinking about it. And the restaurant, at the school, think about it, pre-plan. Don't become obsessive over it, but just take a second to think about it. Any questions about running and escaping? Yes, ma'am. So I'm sitting here thinking, knowing me, because I get, you know, roll under here and play dead. <laughs> That's right. And see, remember, if we can't run, what do we do? We hide. Also, I was in a car one day and my husband was driving and I was in the passenger seat and a man ran out of the store with a gun. He had just robbed the store. My husband dropped, dropped and, and he... And I'm sitting there like a sitting duck. He didn't say, hey, a man with a gun. But God was protecting me. <laughs> Amen. Amen to that. So it's in parts. All right. Any other questions about running and escaping? Go ahead, Brother Alka. So that's a great segue into our next question. So how do we get out of this building if there is an active shooter? We talked about breaking the windows. We talked about the exits. But what if, like Miss Greta said, I can't get out. My mom can't get out. So it goes back to what we were teaching. If you cannot run, and you cannot escape, you hide. If you cannot run, you cannot escape, you hide. That's what you have to do. And that's what I told the nurses. If you, if you can't run out of here and leave your ICU patients, then you hide. You find somewhere to hide. And this is where pre-planning comes in on your part. Say, you know what? Me and mom are gonna sit right here, here. So we're closest to the door if we can. And if we can't, mom, this is gonna be tough for you, but I'm gonna have to throw you on the ground. And I'm gonna have to, as best I can, stuff you under these pews. That's hiding. That's what you do. And you talk about it with mom and you go over it with mom and you think about it. Maybe this is not the best view. Maybe this one is better for hiding. You have to figure that out. Go to Brother Hawkins and say, hey, Brother Hawkins, what do you think? Okay. And that's what you do. You hide. Because it's great to say escape. But if escape is not possible or can't happen quick enough or you don't you're in this building and shots are echoing everywhere and you don't know how to escape or whether if I go out that exit, is he there? The shots coming from up there, wherever, then you hide. You hide under these pews, you hide behind that banister, you get behind tables. Go ahead. I, th I think that um, a good move for like older people would be like, I guess when we come to church, I think it would be okay for them to maybe sit further away with, than the congregation where it's crowded and only because, um, like you said, everything happens fast. Mm -hmm. A shooter will probably go for a most crowded area because he wants to hurt as many people as possible. As many people as possible, right? We have a gentleman at our church. Like he sits way against the wall and I always go over there and say hi, whatever. But I think for older people, 
it will be safer for them in that way where they sit kind of away because if they are able to get down on the floor or whatever and the shooters try to hit the crowded area, they're, they'll be safe. They'll be safe. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just an opinion, but yeah. And that's what needs to take place. Where are my leaders again? Where are my church leaders? Go to them. Raise your hands higher, church leaders. Take a look around, everyone. Bless you all for showing up. And talk to them, everyone. Have these conversations ahead of time and develop your plans. Okay, so the first thing is to run. Um, right. As he's shooting, is it, I mean, should I get up to run? Because I'm an easy target at that point, am I not? That's the decision you're going to have to make at the time. Because I can't give you every scenario and I don't want you to, well, if I get up and run, then they're going to shoot me. So if you, when bullets start flying and you think, oh my God, they're here, they're right now, they're right there, you got to hide. Because if you do jump up and run, you will be a target. So you can't. So just like you said, you would hide. Did you? One thing that you can do is a uh, moving target is a very difficult one to hit. And the person is already nervous what they're probably be doing. So what you do is get as close to the floor as you can. Roll, crawl, whatever you do. Put, drag somebody with you, but stay down low. Don't make yourself so obvious. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You get down. When you're running, you get down, you hide. You make yourself as small a target as possible. I, she has more. <laughs> I can do that, you know. There's uh, no need. We, we know. <laughs> this, this, I like to just add this, that, you know, what happens is sometimes we just, we don't really stop to look. But if you see someone coming in with a big overcoat and it's 90 degrees, you should keep your eye on them <laughs> because they're probably hiding something, you right. know. So you have to observe where you are and what you look, know what you're looking at. Don't say, Oh, that person's crazy. They may be, but if they got on a big, heavy coat, you need to keep your eye on them. Because, right. You know, and quickly find an exit or whatever. Have a plan. And that's where your ushers, your security team, that's where they become involved because they are that first point to stop it. You know, at Crenshaw, if you come in here with a duffel bag, uh, we don't allow duffel bags, big bags, or anything like that. You can leave it here in this side room and then come back afterwards there have been people that said well i don't want to come in i'm sorry we but we don't allow them because you just don't know so right 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 so you don't know. And once again, that's where pre-planning comes in, everyone. You think about that to hide. Find cover. Cover is something that will stop a bullet. That's the first thing you want to look for, something that's cover. If you can't immediately find that cover, find something that will hide you, like these pews. And just for the record, so everyone knows, drywall and stucco Stucco to a maybe a lesser degree, but drywall doesn't stop bullets. So if you're hiding in your room, you need to be on that floor. So find something. If you can't find concealment, I don't want you walking around going, oh, no, maybe that. Uh, I don't I, No, You need to make these decisions fast to find cover, find concealment, something that will hide you. Just like in the videos, people were finding places to hide because the active shooter is looking for what? Easy targets. And they're moving fast, just looking for easy targets. And that's what you have to keep in mind. So find that cover, find that concealment. When you do find you a place, the best place to hide is in a room. 
You lock that room down. You barricade that door. If you can't physically lock it, what do you do? You push furniture in the way. Um, where I work, we don't allow staff to lock offices from the inside because the people they're seeing could lock themselves inside with them. So guess what? You got to knock that file cabinet over. You have to move that desk. You have to buy the little trap, the little plastic door stop to kick in the door when this happens. You have to be prepared physically and mentally to deal with this. So set up your office so you can do those things and think about those things. Um, remain quiet and calm until you receive a clear signal. Once you all are barricaded in a place, a conference room, an office, a storeroom, you keep that door locked and barricaded until you receive an all clear from the police. I tell everybody in the class, until I hear my wife or one of my three daughters say, yeah, you can come out now, the door is staying locked. Now, there are, in all my studying of this, I've, I've not come across any situations where an active shooter pretended to be a cop to get in, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. You keep that door closed until you hear the voice of someone that you know or recognize or that it's safe. Okay. Move away from windows. So we, if we were barricaded in this room, we wouldn't be by those windows because bullets can fly through windows. So we wouldn't be by those windows. We would barricade the doors with heavy furniture. Anything we could find, we would barricade it with to barricade those doors. In the case of these types of doors, there are a couple of ways you can secure these doors, especially because they open out. So when you have doors like these, you can take a shoestring, a tie, a belt, any type of string, and you can wrap it around here in this middle, and that would prevent the door from opening, or you tie it tightly around this closer if it's a single door. That's what you do if the doors open out. Typically, conference room doors open out. Emergency doors open out. That's how you secure those doors. And even once you do that, I'm still piling everything I can in front of that door. So if the door is breached, now the shooter has to get past this barricade. Okay, so anything you can to barricade that door and to prop in front of doors and to keep doors from opening. Turn off the lights. Turn off the lights. Turn off all sources of noises, radios, cell phones, TVs. Turn those things off. Now, I taught this class at my job, and one lady says, well, I was on the DHS website and they said, silence your phones. Said, okay, you know how I silence my phone? By turning it off. If you wanna put your phone on vibrate and work with that, that's fine. Here's why I don't recommend that. Because if your phone is on vibrate, your two o'clock wake you up from your midday nap will ring through the vibration. It will make a noise. Mm -hmm. She says, well, what if I need to read? This is how I tell people you can what if this thing to death. Well, what if I need to receive a text message and alerts about the active shooter? I don't care what's going on out here. I'm barricaded. Uh, this door is locked, barricaded. We're hiding. Once again, when I get that call, I'm sorry, when I get that door knock and say, hey, everything's okay. You can come out, Al. That's what I'm looking for. But I'm not going to have my phone tip off to where I am. One of the things that came out of the Uvalde shooting were students that were calling 911 and talking to 911 dispatchers were shot and killed because it tipped the shooter to where they were. That's why I say call 911 when you're safe, not while the bullets are flying and you're hiding. When you're safe, 
your main thing is to fortify wherever you are or to get under these pews and hide or to get out of this room. That's what you want to do. That's where your focus should be. Um, I'll tell you a few other things. Like they have a lot of videos out there on YouTube and Instagram and things of you hear bullets being fired in the background. How the heck is this footage captured? Because I'm not trying to record this. My main thought and focus is run, hide, fight. She's not gonna get the call if I'm involved in an active shooter. Hey, honey, I love you guys. Uh, it's an active shooter. She's not gonna get that call because my mind is, okay, the door is barricaded, but if he breaks that door, then what do we do? Or shoot, I can't barricade this door. Now I gotta crawl under here. That's where my mind is in the situation. But there's a whole lot of videos out there of you hearing the active shooter in the background while people are running and screaming. And I, I, I teach in this class, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't try to Facebook live this. Don't try to get these hits. Turn off all sources of noise. Remain quiet and calm and in place until you get that clear signal. So once again, if you can't run, then you hide. Hide behind large items like these pews. Like you said, you are kind of a target trying to, now imagine if it's six of us trying to move down this at the same time. You hide, you get down, cabinets, desks, chairs, hide in places you can lock. And if you can't lock it, you barricade it. One of the most interesting um, questions I've been asked in this class, in the San Bernardino shooting, in the San Bernardino shooting, there were several women that were in the bathroom when the shooting started and they heard it. And someone asked, well, how do you secure a bathroom door? Because nothing is movable. I said, well, for me, I would either be in the stall standing on the toilet or I'm laying down across that door and threshold because it's, it's hard to move this um, 180 pounds. <laughs> Maybe 15 years ago, he said, sure. <laughs> That's hard to move. And remember, as many people as possible in that short amount of time. So they're not going to spend all of their time, all their 10, 15 minutes, trying to gain access when there are a lot of other targets running around. You have to be able to think of these things. Once again, not make you paranoid, but to kind of give you a thought process. If I'm ever in a bathroom, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay. Have an emergency bag or kits available. So as a church leadership, make sure you all have emergency kits available, first aid kits, gloves, the building emergency plans. Make sure those are posted and you all have evacuation drills, just like the gentleman said, the drills are critical. Um, if you have to dust off those emergency evacuations plans, do it and then catch up uh, the staff. Those cards that you saw the teacher tell the student to throw under the door, those are called casualty cards. You can find them at any emergency supplies online, but you can also make your own. And that's if you know it's law enforcement asking what's going on in the room. That's what those are. Also at home, have your first aid kits. Have those at home. Have your, this is a little uh, emergency um, disclaimer. Have your first aid kits, fire extinguishers. Go over home evacuation plans with your children or with your family members, with mom. Mom, if this house catches on fire, this is what we're gonna have to do. So she's fully aware. 
Any questions about Hyde? It causes the focus. Right. Yep. You, know, you don't want to give an active shooter a target by popping into a window so you can take a look. Exactly. Because you may, just like the Bowman Jelly, you may pop into the window of the Bowman Jelly. Exactly. It's, it's, uh, you, know, you don't want to make it worse for yourself. You've got yourself in a good place. Just hunker down and wait to wait it out. Exactly. Be at the lowest point possible. Have that door barricaded. Stay away from windows. Lay down on the floor. Be ready. Um, there was a teacher from Uvalde, because I, I looked at this from a totally different standpoint. And what the teacher said was, you know, we were taught to have the kids stay quiet and lay down and things like that. But the gunman came in and shot them anyway. And the gunman, he saw them and they were laid down because you know why? You forgot number one, secure the room. Secure the room. When you hear bullets going on like that, secure the room. Because if the gunman gets in, the laying down, the trying to play dead, and all of that is not going to help at that point. Your first thing is you're hiding, you secure that room. You're gonna ask me about playing dead? Okay. When we're watching that video, I noticed that when the shooter came out of that office, he started like shooting everybody in front of him. But at the same time, there was a guy on the side and he kind of froze, but he had a box in his hand. And I thought to myself, my first inclination would have been to throw a box at him, you know, exactly. and, and it would, uh, it would have, you know, he would have de deeded off the people he was shooting at. Yeah. Maybe he would have come to you, but with that box in his face, you attack him. I mean, you, you take your chances. You know, I, I remember this one saying where it says, uh, courage is not the absence of fear, but it's doing what right in the presence of fear, you know, and, and that's always stood with me. Like, yeah, I'm scared. I'm I'm just as scared of it as everybody else, but I'd rather step step in and fight for my life and the life of the people than to be a sitting duck and just you know be there doing nothing. Exactly, and that's a great segue into our next topic, which is fight. So if you can't run, I'm sorry, you run. If you can't run, you hide. So I've already given you all a few things to barricade these types of doors and just think about the doors you have anywhere else and you can barricade them by throwing furniture once again belts ties um, cardigan sweaters anything you can tie around those handles or tie around those closers there was some video of ucla students that tied the door handle to large pieces of furniture in their room anything to delay because they'll come to that door and it takes time to gain access to a door. If a shooter is holding a weapon, he has to put that weapon down or sling that weapon to try to gain access. And it takes time, time away from their main purpose. The other thing you all is make sure your perimeters are secure. You all know how he gained access into the Uvalde school, right? Through an unlocked back, through an unlocked door. So during, there was a crash, the shooter crashed his truck. Teacher heard the crash and went out there to see what was going on, which is natural. I wouldn't have done it because I'm, I have students. So my main focus is students, not what's going on out there and she went out the door and then she heard gunshots and she ran back in the door. Originally it was said the door was propped or she left it open, but video shows she closed the door. The door was not locked. And I don't expect her in her mind 
to turn and lock a door when she's running from bullets. But guess what? You let the person in. And I know that's kind of harsh to say, but you, when you don't think in an active shooter world or an active shooter manner, when it happens, you're not thinking, lock the door. You're just running in the door and you know what it's saying? Well, the door should automatically lock, but it didn't. So that's why I tell you all, keep that mindset. Make sure your, your church is secure. I, one of the things at work, if you see peep smokers prop doors open to go smoke and come back in, you know what I do? I pick those things up that they prop doors with and I close those doors. Guess what? You go back around to get in or you use your card key to get in. So be careful of those types of things around your church. If you see something that you perceive is a security risk to the church, let leadership know. Okay? So that's how we would barricade this situation, but um, this, this church and this hall. And think about that wherever you are. But what if we can't? We can't run. Bullets are flying. We can't hide. So what's the next thing to do? You fight. You fight. As a last resort, and when your life is in imminent danger, you fight. Yes, I'm telling you all, you fight because your life depends on it now. There is a, I recommend everyone find this video at a Waffle House. There's a store employee with a mop who's approached by a guy with a rifle at the Waffle House. And he took that mop and he was able to beat and hit that rifleman long enough to discourage him from going in and shooting in the Waffle House. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so Waffle House, yes. Um, I hop for those of us here on the West Coast. <laughs> so, so you have to have that fight mentality. You can't panic, you can't freeze. Um, there was a video of the guy, in the video, the guy was mopping and when the gunman came out, he just stood there free, frozen. And then there was the guy that attacked him with the fire extinguisher that sprayed it. And we're gonna talk about why he sprayed, but you wanna act to incapacitate the shooter by acting as aggressively as possible against him or her whatever it takes, whatever you have to do. You wanna throw items or use improvised weapons. You wanna disrupt the shooter's ability to see, breathe, and control the weapon. It's trained on AR-15 rifles, part of our emergency response team. In order to shoot an, a rifle accurately, you have to have all three of those. So you want to disrupt one, two, or all three of them. That's why in the video, he sprayed the fire extinguisher. But if he would have also taken the fire extinguisher and beat him to a pulp, that's also acceptable. Anything you can to stop the shooter. You want to disrupt their ability to see, breathe, and control the weapon. That means anything can be used as a weapon anything and when i say anything i do mean anything remember i told you i was going to come back to that point anything can be used as a weapon this is not the ten of the most high this is not that situation where you have to tie a rope around 
them to go in the most high place where if you mess up one thing, you're dead. We don't live in that. That, that was taken away by Jesus Christ, our Savior. So if you have to use this as a weapon, you use it. If you have to use anything in this church as a weapon, you use it. Brother Hawkins would be glad to replace any of this stuff that you use to stop an active shooter. I don't have to ask him. I don't even have to look in his direction. I know he's okay with that. Anything you use as a weapon, nothing is off limits. And think about this in your offices. What are some of the things you can use in your office? I want someone to picture their office, their desk, their cubicle. What are some of the things you can use? Stapler. Stapler. What else? Letter opener. Letter opener. Yes. What else? A base. Yes. I'm going to move on back here. You guys, what else can we use? Lamp on your desk. Chairs. What else, gentlemen? Books. Trays. Anything, bottle of water, keyboard, hot coffee, hairspray. I taught this guy, yeah, you spray hairspray in the face of a shooter and see how far they'll go after that. I taught this class and a lady said, you know what? I would use my heels to fight. You darn straight, you use your heels. Anything you can use to fight that shooter. Anything. I also taught this class in an auditorium and someone said, I would use the flagpole. I went, you know what? You see that point up there? I'm going to add that to my presentation. Anything you can use, whether you're at home, whether you're in the mall or at school, at your office, in this church, anything you can use. Also add yelling and screaming. Just before the guy fired the fire extinguisher, you heard him go, yeah, his war cry. It's distracting. It also gives you that uh, you need because when you reach this point, you're fighting for your life. You're fighting for your life. And anybody that can strap on a gun, a rifle, and going with the intent to kill people is dedicated to the program. They're dedicated to what they're doing. You need to be even more dedicated to survive. You need to be dedicated to your survival and your family's survival and your other church members' survival. Because when you reach this point, the gunman wants to kill you. You have to want to live more than the gunman wants to kill you. Go ahead, yes. Thank you. Uh, I see we are uh, talking about major problem. That's the culture of violence we are into in the midst of it. And uh, worship places are not being safe. Uh, supermarkets or stores that we go out, is not safe. Exactly. So we as a society allow this to happen. Now, common ordinary citizens seem to have only one option to me. Mm -hmm. Now that is lawmakers are voted to be in the office. They need to make laws not to allow ordinary, not the active military members, ordinary citizens not to have this high caliber war zone armaments. So I think we are doing okay with the prevention, trying, but we could also go back and do our very best to prevent from these to keep increasing and growing and we cannot be safe to go out to common places and I mean, do the living thing. So that, that is something as a voters, we have to also consider thinking who is going to be in the office. 
to make laws to keep us safe. Government is government to make sure the citizens are safe. That's the first thing I would consider. Otherwise, so I'm going to take the laws and whatever it is to prevent myself. Then uh, that concerns me a great deal. Also, we need to consider on the prevention side also more so. I'm done. Thank you. I, I don't disagree with you, but for this class, I have to teach what you do when the bullets start flying. The other part of that, that's for everyone as society to take their individual beliefs. But for me, this is what I wanna make sure everyone leaves with, run, hide, fight. Um, and then that's for a discussion for you all later. But in this class, you run, hide, and fight. And remember, when you reach fight, you're fighting for your life. It is not a game. The killer has this, the killer has put everything they had into killing you. You have to put everything you have into surviving. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I would have seen a film like this that I would have been aware. But it was like six something in the morning. It was like during winter. And um, it might have been maybe 15, 20 years ago. I was riding the bus to work. It was like 6 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. So by it being real cold, this man got on the bus with his whole face covered up with a you know, with the eyes and the mouth. Yeah, and I didn't think nothing of it because it was real cold. Mm -hmm. And I got on the bus early because I had to ride a long way. So I was sitting in the back and the man is just letting people, you know, get on the bus. And as the bus got crowded, he stood up with a gun. Mm -hmm. But I'm in the back and I done watched him the whole ride, not thinking nothing about this mask. And then he starts saying he gonna, what he was going to do to people, the driver. And I got nervous. And I had on my uniform. So oh, he's going to get me. I work for the post office. Covered up and got down behind the seat. Mm -hmm. And one of the men, he was a minister. He stood up. And he was telling us, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. So he's up in the front with the gun saying what he's going to do to somebody. The man from the back hopped on him. And when he uh, got on top of him, the bus pulled over and I hopped off and ran. Right. I don't know what happened. I wasn't going to report no incident. You just got off and ran. I got out. Don't right. ask me no questions, but because I had rode a long way with that man. Right. But if. You said the minister had the gun? No. <laughs> I didn't say the minister. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, let me take the mask down. The minister, he was, the people that was behind, he was saying, he hopped in from the back and jumped on top of him. The, and the gun flew. The minister the bus over, the bus saved pulled the day. Over, huh? And when the doors opened, I jumped out and ran. <laughs> so the minister saved the day. <laughs> minister saved the day. Right, but that's why, and that's why we... Bus. That's why the minister, that's why Brother Hawkins has brought you here to teach you these things so you can think about it. So when you see that, you're like, oh, that don't look good. I'm getting off at the next exit. I'll wait another bus. So remember, so we already talked about what some of the things that could be used as weapons. We talked about there's nothing sacred in here that cannot be used as weapons. Use whatever you can as weapons. Fire extinguishers, staplers, flagpoles, coat racks, umbrellas, books, anything you can throw, high, anything you can throw, swing, and use as a weapon. Laptop computers, desktop phones, pictures, cups, mugs, anything you can throw. And I teach this in my at the at work also, and I tell them you use any kind of equipment you can. It doesn't matter. We will replace it. And we talked about what could be used in this room.
Commit to your actions when you have to fight. Commit to it. Be fully committed because the shooter is fully committed to killing you. Once again, it takes a full on commitment to decide I'm going to kill people and to carry it out. You don't get much more committed than that. So you better be fully committed to surviving this. Any questions about fight? Any questions about run? Any questions about run, hide, or fight? What to expect when law enforcement arrives? I think this part is also critical because I'll need to guide you all what to do when law enforcement arrives. Because once again, most people do what they think on what they see on TV. So the first and foremost thing I want you to understand when law enforcement arrives, when they get on the scene, their first and only job is to stop the shooter. They need to stop the shooter to stop the killing and the injuring of people. So what that means is they're going to walk past you and around you, even if you're on the floor injured, to get to the shooter. And I'm telling you this so you can be aware so you don't lose it, so you don't reach out and try to grab onto them, so you don't try and stop them, so you don't try to thank them at this point. That's not the time but you will know this is almost over. I just have to hold on for a few more minutes until they get the shooter. But you do mentally have to be prepared for them to walk around you and over you while they're searching to stop the shooter. Medical teams will come once the shooter is stopped or in another part of the campus or another part of the building, then it's safe for medical teams to come in. And you need to know this so you don't lose it when they walk past you or you try to disrupt them from stopping the shooter. Remain calm and follow the officer's orders. This is critical because when you're coming out of a building with an active shooter and they're evacuating you and you come out, the first thing you're gonna see are guns drawn on you. And they're gonna say, put your hands in the air. And you know what you're gonna do? Why, I'm not the shooter? What, why are they making me do, what's wrong? With That's what you're gonna do. And you know what that does? It delays everything. It hinders the response and it puts you in danger. Do what you're told, follow directions. I'm explaining to you why now so you you will know oh, he said this was going to happen. They do that because we don't know who the shooter is. There was a shooter that escaped with the crowd. He took off all his gear and everything and he walked out with the students. So they don't know who the shooter is, male or female. There have been female active shooters. So do what you're told. Get those hands up in the air. They're going to shout commands. If you don't do what they tell, they're going to force you to do it. Just do it. As soon as you come out of that building, they're going to tell you, get on the ground. And when you get on the ground, there's going to be an officer that comes up and they're going to do a quick pat down to make sure you don't have any weapons. And then they're going to get you up and send you to the safe area. That's what to expect, just follow directions. Keep I, hands visible at all times. This is something else that's critical. Something else that's critical. Don't come out trying to Facebook Live this. Don't come out trying to TikTok or Instagram this. Come out with your hands up so they can see. Don't come out with things in your hand. Don't come out pointing because you see how that looks to an officer looking for somebody with a gun. Just come out with your hands up, follow directions. 
avoid making quick movements. Don't run to the officers and thank them then. There will be a period afterward, just like in the video where they can thank you. Put all items out of your hands. Avoid pointing, screaming, yelling. Do not ask for help or directions because the officers are trying to stop the shooter. So don't stop them um, and proceed in the direction the officers are coming from. So if they're screaming in that door, you would proceed out that door. You're gonna see different officers, different uniforms, different things, because every officer within a 10, 15 mile radius is gonna respond. You're gonna see detectives in suits. You're gonna see SWAT gear. You're gonna see different types of weapons. You're gonna see long rifles. You're gonna see tear gas rifles. You're gonna see Kevlar helmets. You're gonna see the officers that were training down the street in short. You're gonna see a lot of that. Just be aware that those things are going to see. You're gonna see a lot of tactical equipment. And I already said, you're gonna see long guns, rifles, shotguns. Officers may use pepper spray and tear gas. You have to be aware of that so you don't panic when it happens. I've been pepper sprayed and tear gassed and they do not kill you. Pepper spray will burn your eyes, face, mouth, and head, and the tear grass will make you feel like your lungs are burning and coughing, but it won't kill you. And I'm telling you this, so when it happens, you will be aware and said, Al said this would happen, I still have to run, hide, fight, or get out of here. Any questions about what to expect when law enforcement arrives? Uh huh. Yeah, so myself and another brother stopped at a, uh, a gas station um, and I'm pumping the gas. He went inside the store and when he came out, he noticed a woman being beat by a man in their vehicle and he saw blood. So he went to the driver's side asking him to let her go. And then the guy got out of the truck. And when I turned around and looked to see what was going on, all I saw was the guy getting a hammer out of the back. So I immediately stopped pumping gas and go over. We put the guy down on the ground. Right. And um, we kept him on the ground because we didn't know what he had. And sure enough, literally within two minutes, the sheriff's pulled up. And mm -hmm. there's a hammer there on the ground next to us. So they don't know which one of us they're supposed to be going after. And they uh, put us all in handcuffs till they found out what happened. Until they found out what was going on. Yeah, with Just, guns in our faces, yeah. Yeah, and it's important that you say that because it's important that you don't lose it and get mad at the police for not knowing who the bad guy is. Just like in the video, the guy was saying, he's the shooter, he's the shooter. No, get down, because they don't know. So thank you for adding that. So keep that in mind when they're responding, we don't know everybody. So everybody has to follow that protocol. So what to expect during the shooting when the bullets are flying? Gunshots. Expect the sound of gunshots. And I don't mean like, one or two shots, it's going to be continuous. It may be a high powered rifle where it's if you've heard the clips from the Las Vegas shooting, it may be a handgun where it's pow, 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 but it's gonna be a lot of shots, very different from fireworks. And they're gonna keep going and going you have to push past that and think, run, hide, fight. I'm hearing these gunshots, but I still need to run, hide, or fight. Lots and lots of gunshots, especially if it's two shooters. The next thing you're going to hear, or is the next thing you're gonna have is the smell of gunpowder. If anyone's ever shot a weapon 
It's a very distinct smell. It's not like an electrical fire or a burning paper or a fireplace. It's a very distinct smell. And that smell is going to be in the air. Lots of smoke. High power weapons create lots of smoke from the muzzle. So be prepared for things to be cloudy and foggy. Fire alarms and smoke alarms going off. It's going to be a lot of ringing going off because as people go out emergency exits, those alarms are going to go off. As the smoke from the muzzle fire goes out up into the smoke, into the sprinklers and the alarms, it's gonna set those things off. That's going to be pretty chaotic, but you still have to remember run, hide, fight. With all of that going on, the smell of smoke, the guns, the fire alarms, you still keep in mind, run, hide, fight. Yelling and screaming. There's going to be a lot of yelling and a lot of screaming. You have to mentally prepare yourself to work through that to deal with that. That's why this class is so important because you will know this is going to happen and you can still think through it. Run, hide, fight. Amongst the screaming, the yelling, the gunfire, all of that, you still have to think, run, hide, fight. How can I get out of here? Where can I hide? I got to fight now. Blood. There's going to be lots of blood. The San Bernardino shooting, the seasoned veteran SWAT officers said it was a massive amount of blood. Blood everywhere. You have to be prepared to see that so you don't freeze so you don't become the deer in the headlights. Al said I was gonna see this. Massive amounts of blood. So gun smoke, gun, gun, no, uh, gun shots, fire alarms, possibly sprinklers, all of this going off. And you still have to run, hide or fight. Injured persons, and dead bodies. You have to be prepared to see that. And let me be the first to tell you that a person that's been killed in an active shooter, this is not what the dead body looks like. If you can't tell, my eyes are closed. That is not what a dead body looks like. That is not what someone looks like that has just been recently killed in an active shooter. So when you see bodies and that look, that blank look with the eyes open, you don't freeze and become enamored with that and try to figure that out because your mind is going to be processing all of this, but you want to train your mind, hey, this is a part of an active shooter. I still have to run, hide, fight. You know what else? You may see your own church members dead. You're going to see your church members, your family members, people that you love and your friends dead or injured. You develop your plan now on whether you're gonna help and pull people out or are you gonna run, hide and fight? You think about that now. I'm not here to tell you whether you should or should not help people. That's your decision. But you better have a plan and have thought it out already so that you're not trying to catch up when all of this starts. 
so that your mind is already there and ready when all of this starts. So that you're not trying to come up with your plan when all of this starts, because it's almost too late. This is what you expect when the bullets are flying and when this is happening. Keep this in mind so you don't become the deer in the headlights. You had a question here? I'm sorry. I think you I'm sorry? I think you answered. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I do want to talk a little bit. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Brother Al, you spoke in about a situation that when you are in a closed uh, place, mm -hmm. such as a church building, uh, a school, mm -hmm. and settings like that. But I'd like to know what's your take on the, uh, the Las Vegas shooting when those people, they were outside. I, I get what you're saying and running <clears throat> and hiding, but that was like an open setting and he was just popping them off. That was really, it was just a wild scatter at the time. So, I mean, I get the running and the hiding, but because it was in that setting, they was easily to be picked off. You got any comments on that? I absolutely do. Very good question. Very good question. For those of you that are not familiar with the Las Vegas shooting, this shooting, the, the person was on 30th floor overlooking the rodeo um, concert. Broke, an op broke open a window and started firing on the crowd from that high up. The same thing applies. If the shots are coming from a high up building, the first thing you need to do is run. You need to run and get out of that kill zone. But if you're there and everybody else is trying to get out of that kill zone, that is gonna make it harder to run. So then you start looking for place to hide. In that particular concert, there was the stage there were chairs for the higher playing people. And then everybody else was standing up. And then they had some bleachers. So in that case, what you would do is that's really a tough situation. But the same thing applies. You run to get out of there. If you can't, you run to those bleachers and hide under those bleachers, under those uh, chairs or under that stage, anywhere you can find a hiding place. It is tougher in that situation to find a hiding place. But you may not be handed the perfect scenario. You can't not go to these things for fear of that. But that's one thing you may have to consider. You know what, honey? Um, let's pass up the House of Blues and the Prince concert. Because it's all standing and they piled 250 people in this building with four exits. So you know what, maybe we'll pass that one up. But if you do go, the minute you step in, you're going, okay, here I am, it's 500 people around me. If anything happens, that's where I'm headed. And you make your way to that place. Very good uh, question. The thing you don't do is freeze like, oh my God, where are these shots coming from? Where are the... You don't do that. You get out of that kill zone. Because that, that's more of a sniper type active shooter where they're over the person and the people and they're just firing. But the same principles apply. You got to run and get out of there. If you can't, you got to hide. There is no way to fight that type of person. So you either got to run or you got to hide. Did that help answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. And remember, there's 
it's not going to work 100 percent of the time in every situation so if some of you are going yeah that that run high fight is fine but what if you can what if this thing to death what if 20 guys came in here with assault rifles to kill us all? you don't want to do that because my thing still if 20 guys came in here with assault rifles to try to kill us all i'm still going to try to get out of here or i'm still going to be hiding or I'm going to do my best to fight. But you better think about it now. OK. So after the shooting, this is to my church leadership. After a shooting or any major incident, conduct a debriefing. Leadership, talk, have a debriefing. What went right? what went wrong, what we're definitely not going to do next time, and how we're going to make it better. And you allow your staff, excuse me, you allow the members to all voice, and you talk about this, not from a, you should have done A, B, and C, not from that perspective, but a, we need to learn so we can better respond. The debriefing also really helps people start healing. It helps the membership start healing. It helps everyone involved start healing. So conduct that debriefing, utilize resources. If something like that were to happen, there are gonna be resources coming from every place. Utilize those resources, my church leadership, utilize them. There'll be mental health, monetary, all kinds of services, use them. Are there any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. This is your brief talk on the church says, but we almost have to become hyper vigilant. It has to become a way of life. For instance, I'm in a restaurant last night with and I go to the bathroom, I'm washing my hand, and a guy comes in and lays a bag and he's rifling through it. And I'm thinking, this is it. This is it right now. This guy, what is this guy bringing? A... So I spoke to him. I don't speak to nobody in the bathroom, not in a normal situation. Mm -hmm. I spoke to him, hey man, what's up? And I got his attention. Mm -hmm. wash my hands and slid out so i'm just saying that to say we have to do it all the time we have to be active shooter everywhere we go exactly and you remember in the beginning i told everyone although i'm talking from a church perspective you take these principles and use them wherever you are school market restaurant wherever you are you use these principles Right. 
save a life instead of just being an impartial witness or you know a spectator. It is going to become history. And you need to become part of history by taking action. Exactly. So let these seeds germinate and produce a fruit in your life that could potentially save somebody else. Exactly. My wife and I were going to a baby shower later on this afternoon for one of my um, workers. How many times has someone been thrown out of a wedding, baby shower, house party to come back and shoot up the place? So we're already, this applies to that. Just, I don't want you to think, oh my God, I can't go anywhere. But what I want you to think is when you step into that venue, party, house, auditorium, house of blues, Yankee Stadium, Dodger Stadium, Raider Stadium, that you think if something happens, how are we going to get out of here? Or if something happens, this is where I'm going to hide. That's what I want you to do. I want you to put your back to the to the to the walls in the restaurant. I want you to see the guy ruffling through stuff and you go, oh shoot. I can't say, hey, what the heck are you doing? But if I say, hey man, what's going on? It changes his mindset, like, man, now, now, right. And it allows you time to get out of there. That's what I want from this, you all. I want it to germinate in you. I want you to think about it. I want you to share it with your family. I want you to go get that video off of YouTube, the sheriff's video. And even if you can't put on a two hour class, you can play that for your mom. You can play that for your aunties. You can play that for your kid. You can say, hey, hey, daughters in college, sit down, take a watch this video. And what do you think? That's what I want. You all ready for the test? Any other questions? <laughs> she doesn't need the mic. <laughs> oh, no, I'm kidding. She said, why do we need a test? <laughs> she said, why do we have a test? <laughs> all right, this one, we should be able to know the answers. During an active shooter, what is the first thing you should do I'm not going to give you any more answers. Run. If you can't run, hide. And if you can't hide, fight. I hope this all has resonated with you all. Um, are there any other questions? Let's go, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Oh, I'm sorry. There is a question. Go ahead. I noticed you didn't address uh, anyone out in the audience to have a weapon or something like that uh, to, to fight back. Oh, yeah. I said any weapon, anything you can use. Oh, that included. Yeah, anything. Oh, okay. Just so we're clear, everybody. Just so we're clear, anything you can use as a weapon, you use it. Right. Anything. I see. I see you guys. Anything. Anything. Does Does that clear it up for everybody? Because if I go down a list, then somebody's going to say, well, what about this? Anything. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, my question. So it should always go run, hide, fight, because me being from L.A., I might be inclined to fight first. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> well, it, what the situation you're handed, fighting may be the only thing you can do that comes first. I but you, I do want you to run through the progressions because it's no need to fight if you can run and get out of there. Yeah, That's why it's run, hide, fight. You don't want to go to fight if you can easily get out of there. Does that make sense? Well, no, it, may, it makes sense, right? But being from L.A., kind of like fight, hide, run, you know? 
<laughs> I'm just saying. But once again, once again, everyone. <laughs> but but once again, everyone, why would you fight if you can easily run? Because when you're fighting, that's it. Yeah. I think if I had my family with me, I'd run first. If I'm by myself, I'm fighting first. Run, hide, fight is the progression. Right. Don't don't switch it up. Right up. Don't switch it up because you'll put yourself in a situation to fight when you really could run and get out right. of there. Okay, I heard you. Yep. Like, and there were two. I see you guys. Keep your hands up. Okay. Okay. I don't have a question, but I do have an experience that I that I had uh, some years back. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was getting out of my car, I had just taken my mother home at the time when she was alive. Mm -hmm. We had gone uh, grocery shopping. And then I was on my way home. So I still had my groceries and things in the car. I was getting ready to get out. There were five uh young men in a car i noticed so i hesitated i stayed in the car for a minute or two mm -hmm. and then they got out they were saying their buys and things like that so they started walking in the opposite direction what happened was what i didn't see is that the other guy was coming around he came to my car opened my door as i well as i was opening my door because i thought everything was okay and he had a gun I was faced with a gun at that time. Oh, and he said, get out of the car, lady. So I got out of the car. And so when he, uh, you know, I was kind of baffled because I was wondering, you know, what happened. So I got out, he was still pointing the gun at me. And, you know, in that situation, I was taken by surprise. I didn't know, you know, and, uh, I was just there. So what what would you do in a situation like that? You did you did the right thing mm -hmm. because that's not an active shooter, that's a carjack. So it's different circumstances. If anyone puts a gun to you and say, get out of the car, you get out of the car. Which I did, yes. That's what you do. You're not going to fight or you should not fight in that situation. Mm -hmm because he's not actively trying to kill you and other people. Mm -hmm. That's that's a carjacking, that's a crime yeah, in and progress. And he did take, he took my car. Yeah, and bye-bye car. Mm -hmm. You know what I tell, you know what I tell people? It's, oh man, that's a nice car. Yeah, that car is all state's problem, mm -hmm. not mine. Well, my, my thing was that I just prayed. As he was pointing the gun Amen at me, I that. just said a prayer. Yeah. You say a prayer and you follow, you get out of that car. Okay, go ahead. We're at a congregation where there's a lot of elderly members mm -hmm. who can't run. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe they're able to slide down and hide. I'm not sure if I, I'm, I'm troubled with your solution. If my mother was in here, and I'm running, I save myself, and she gets wiped out. I, ca I can't live with that. And that's why I've never told you to do that. I never told you to leave your mom. If you can't run because of your mom, which is what I said for mom up there, you hide with mom. If mom can't run and you can't shuffle mom out, you hide. That's what you do. You hide with mom. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard on mom, but you got to do it. That's where pre-planning comes in. Just like I said earlier, you need to go to your church leadership and say, hey, we have a lot of elderly people who can't run and on their own, they can't hide. What are we going to do, leadership? And you all start the planning. But what if you're at the Costco with mom and the bullets start ringing out? That's where your pre-planning comes into play. I know I can't run mom. So guess what, mom? I might have to throw you on the ground and cover you up, mom, or stuff you under these pews, mom, or push you in a door 
open up a door and push you in a store cabinet, I mean a storage closet, or shuffle you to the bathroom and, and get put my back against that door and hold that door. If you can't run, just like the nurses in ICU, I'm not gonna leave my patient. I never told you to leave your patient. But if you can't leave your patient, then you hide. You barricade that ICU room door and you hide. So that's what you do with mom, okay? And then if you are hiding, you may have to fight on mom's behalf. Just commit to that fighting, okay? So I would never tell anyone to leave their parents or, or a loved one or a fellow church member. What I do tell you is think about this now, not when the bullets start ringing out and you're going, oh shoot, what do I do with mom? Or what do we do with sister Carter? Or what do we do with brother Davis? That, that's a, not the time. The time to think about it is beforehand. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. If you're at a church where you have a lot of seating, you might have to look at your security setup. Cameras outside the door, watching people walk in. Yep. Um, the type of brethren that you have at the door. Yep. You know, you just have to monitor things when you have people that can't move fast, and you and you have a lot of them, and probably have more men working security at the door and really looking at people that come in, and usually. We know our members and we know a stranger. And once a stranger come in, the brethren that are walking around and working doors, keep an eye on. Yep. That, that'll help. That's, you'll have to harden your target while keeping it welcoming to the community and maintaining a hospitable church. But you have to harden the target. I strongly recommend church leadership, the, the United States Department of Homeland Security, they have, set, they have so much material for hardening houses of worship as targets while remaining hospitable. They have so much training. They also have a lot of free training that you all can send your teams to because it's not, it's not good enough just to say, hey, Brother Logan, guess what? You work in the door today and Brother Logan is so young or brother Logan is so old that they're distracted. Or look, looking at the dresses coming in. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I'm keeping it real because we've had to have these discussions at our church. I've told our security guard at our church, hey, I'm watching these cameras. You haven't been in this parking lot the whole time. Well, will I sit out front? I don't need you sitting out front on King. I need you patrolling everywhere. Then when the money moves, then you move up front. Have those conversations. Don't just pick anyone to be your heart and target. And then you train the ones you, you pick. Maybe Brother Logan is better suited as an usher that's somewhere else but not on our exterior, we need the gentleman that's constantly thinking this and that type of mindset on the exterior and at these doors. And then have a conversation with the children. Hey, I, I don't know how to start this conversation, but let's start it this way. If there's an active shooter, how do you need us to help you and mom? as opposed to saying, mom don't look like she can get out of here in time, so what do you want to do? And the reason I know how to have that because I'm a manager in LA County and I can't say, if there's a fire and earthquake, you don't look like you can get out of here because then I'm in trouble. So everyone go to leadership and say, I need help or hey, we're leadership, please come to us, okay? Mm -hmm. um, when if when it happens, we can't rely on outside sources to call the authorities. Should we appoint someone inside the church? Hey, this week you're going to be the one. If the active shooter comes in, we need you to dial nine one one and then turn your phone off. 
Yep. Make sure we do it. Okay. That's a great idea. You can, you can pick someone, hey, you're the caller, and that person has to know, we don't need you coming in and getting involved. We need you to make that call. Okay. And when they make that call, the dispatchers are going to fire a lot of questions at you. What type of gun? What are they wearing? Are they actively killing people? Are they barricade? They're going to ask those questions. Answer the ones you can, and the ones you can't, they'll keep going. But that helps the response. OK? Any other questions? Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Most kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, hallowed be your great and glorious name. We come to you at this time, Heavenly Father, thanking you, thanking you, thanking you, first and foremost for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. We also, Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing this class to take place to train your people, Heavenly Father, on what to do and how to help, because we know as church leadership, you have placed this responsibility square on us. So we thank you for allowing this class to go through. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that the things that have been said here fall on fertile ground, Heavenly Father, and that it grows and that it expands from this church to other churches of Christ, Heavenly Father, and that what was taught here can spread and help people in their daily lives. We love you, Heavenly Father. We praise you, Heavenly Father. All glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thank you all.